Hello and welcome to Eye on Africa. I'm Clarisse Fortuné, our top stories today. It's now official. Joseph Wakai has been declared Liberia's president-elect with 50.64% of the vote. The African Union congratulates Wakai for his big win. And it's one month before the DRC general elections. President Chisekedi prepares to run against more than 20 candidates. We'll find out more about some of the main contenders. Students are among the victims of Nigeria's rampant inflation. Some federal universities have been hit with a 300% increase in tuition. Students at the University of Lagos are trying to fight back. It's a tight victory, but Joseph Wakai has been declared the winner of Liberia's presidential elections by the Electoral Commission. The political veteran beat incumbent George Weah with 50.64% of the vote. The African Union has now congratulated Wakai for his big win, but for the president-elect, many challenges await him. The next thing is what to do after taking it from them is to deal with the issues that have been hanging over this country, corruption, the issues of non-delivery of services to the people, which are, uh, I mean, an array of them. So we have to deal with those issues of corruption, the suffering of the people. Liberia is a very rich country. We know very well that agriculture can prosper in this country. In fact, sitting down here, there's nobody who has served this country in that area better than myself. And our correspondent, Justice Baidu, has been following the elections for us. The results from this election show that Liberia is a heavily divided country. President George Weah and the now incoming President Joseph Buakai had between them under 40,000 votes separating the two. The campaign till today had recorded some incidents of violence and acrimony with up to four people losing their lives before the main election last month. Mr. Weah said in his speech last Friday that he would be supporting the new government to implement some of its key uh, policies. It remains to be seen if the two will be able to put their past differences and competition aside to implement the transition that lies ahead. Punitive for accountability has, has been on the rise. We've had a number of public officials being sanctioned uh, by the U.S. government for corruption. Those uh, individuals have not been investigated and prosecuted by this administration. So we're hoping that the new administration can do that, not just those officials that have been sanctioned, but others that have been accused of corruption. We believe as civil society that uh, there cannot be true reconciliation and peace in the absence of accountability. Mr. Buakai's historic win makes him the first presidential candidate to return a former ruling party to power since 1878. Election as well in Senegal. Basiru Diomai Fai, a new name, is also a new candidate of choice for the opposition. A decision after the Supreme Court blocked detained Usman Sonko from running in the next presidential election, his party, PASTEF, said that party Sonko himself endorsed his choice. From Dakar, Sarah Sako and Iliman Dao explain. On Sunday, Senegal's main opposition party, PASTEF, said it was backing Basiro Jomai Fai as an alternative presidential candidate, with their first choice, Usman Sonko, currently barred from running. All candidates are required to collect 45,000 signatures of support from the public in order to compete in the race. We are confident that we have collected at least 2 million signatures of support through the strategies we put in place. But on Monday, party chiefs caveated the naming of Basiru Jomai Fai as a candidate, saying their first choice remains Usman Sonko, a firebrand figure dogged by legal troubles. Once the signatures are collected, Fai will submit his dossier to the Constitutional Council. Usman Sonko is still our first choice. We'll put strategies in place to ensure that we're able to stand up to a regime whose only goals are to prevent Usman Sonko from running as candidate and to destroy PASTEF. Basiru Jumai Fai 
is currently in detention, serving a seven-month sentence for crimes including the spreading of fake news. Political analysts say that PASTEF, a party officially dissolved by the government in July, is taking a significant electoral risk. Many supporters have an almost visceral attachment to Usman Sonko, who has a lot of charisma and personifies the hopes of many. Alongside the political and judicial challenges facing Basiru Diomaifai at the moment, we have to see whether he'll be able to capture Usman Sonko's popularity. The definitive list of candidates permitted to run in next year's presidential election will be published on January 20th. And in other news, Abye is a territory straddling the border of both Sudan and South Sudan. 30 people were killed there on Sunday in a, in a series of attacks by armed militias and soldiers wearing uniforms of South Sudan's National Army. That's according to local officials. The Abye area rich in all resources and is claimed by both sides. A dialogue was interrupted by the war between rival militaries. Premature babies have arrived in Egypt after they were evacuated from Gaza's largest hospital. Al-Shifa has been described by the World Health Organization as a death zone. The hospital has been the focus lately of Israel, seeking to uncover what it says are Hamas command centers in tunnels underneath the facility. And finally, the G20 compact with Africa conference is taking place in Germany with leaders from more than a dozen African countries and G20 nations, a gathering to boost private investment in the continent. The German government has already pledged to invest 4 billion euros in green energy projects until 2030. Chancellor Olaf Scholz said the wealth of raw materials should be processed in the African nations they come from. It's uh, definitely election season in DRC. The de election campaign has officially kicked off for the general elections on December 20th. There are over 20 vying to become president of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Among the hopefuls, four are presented as the main contenders, all with different race horses. Clemens Waller tells us more. They are over 20, all vying to become president of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Among the presidential hopefuls, four are presented as the main contenders, all with different objectives. First of all, the incumbent president, Félix Tshisekedi. At age 60, he is running for a second term. He is defending his record, underpinned by social measures such as free schooling and universal medical health care. But, according to his opponents, he has failed to achieve his objectives regarding the fight against corruption and improving the economy and national security. Then there is Martin Fayulu, the unsuccessful candidate of the 2018 presidential election. This former executive of an oil outlet is out for revenge. He and his supporters maintain he was the victor five years ago. Within a divided opposition, Fayulu is currently going it alone, having refused to form a common front with other opposition candidates at a conference in Pretoria last week. At 58, Moise Katumbi, former governor of Katanga, already has the support of three other candidates who have withdrawn from the race. Seth Kikuni, Frank Diongo, and former prime minister Matata Ponyo Mapon. All are calling on their supporters to vote for the leader of the Together for the Republic party. He is focusing his campaign on his record in Katanga, with the construction of roads and schools, as well as the development of agriculture. And finally, Dr. Dennis Mukwege, winner of the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize. Nicknamed the man who repairs women, he is based in eastern Congo, where armed militias have long carried out attacks on civilians. He is highly critical of the government and its inability to curb the conflict that is tearing the region apart. His watchwords in this campaign, peace and the fight against corruption. Inflation affects everything, including access to education. In Nigeria, some universities have increased their tuition over 300% both for undergraduate and new students. Against the backdrop of the country's cost of living crisis, the University of Lagos tried to fight back by staging many demonstrations. Our team in Lagos went to the university. Nigeria's economic crisis is ballooning the cost of education. Joshua Deyeye is one of the many public university students who now have to find new ways of financing their studies after fees were tripled. 
even when it was still 15,000 Naira, some people could not still afford the fee. You know, students who are, you know, from pocket to mouth and from mouth to pocket, so they have to go all around to get, you know, even that 15,000 Naira, a token of 15,000 Naira. How much more when the fee is now about 80,000 Naira plus. The costs have jumped further and faster than many expected. There are worries that millions of students may now feel pressure to spend fewer years in expensive higher education. I expected the increase in school fees, but I never expected it to be this much. I get the fact that um, the country is hard, everything is expensive, everything has doubled in prices. But as for school fees, it's kind of like tripled or even more than tripled for most of us. The increases mean students will have to pay the equivalent of 287 euros per semester instead of the usual 31 to 91 euros. The Lagos State University claims the changes are essential as the income from the old fees was barely enough to cover its electricity bills. But the school has tried to help students hit hard by the hike in course prices. Some can now earn extra money by coaching their peers. Even before now, we have all those provisions. What we have done is to make them better. We have what we call a work study, where a student could work for about 10 hours in a week and for 10 weeks, and we'll be earning around between 500 and 1,000 per hour, which will amount to around 100,000, between 50 and 100,000 per semester. Although the Nigerian government still funds education, more money is needed. UNESCO recommends that the state spends 15 to 20 percent of its budget on education, but in Nigeria, the current figure is less than 10 percent. Well, that's it for this edition. Thank you for watching Eye on Africa.